so no, look, great to be here again. I think, yeah, I actually spoke at the first autumn school. I'm uh, the only member of our committee that have spoken at that first autumn school. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want to do, I mean, you know, the feedback and, and generally it's, it's all very positive on the autumn school. I think everyone enjoys themselves and I think you know the, you know the score. It's sort of high standard after the first lecture and it's um, informal. So you talk to anyone and you ask them questions and everyone's only too happy to share their knowledge. But we would get feedback that it can seem specialist. Um, so this is hopefully a quick but informative run through Ernest Shackleton, his expeditions, but also a bit about him outside the expeditions. I'm into numbers, I'm a statistician, so I'm not boring, um, but I try and bring numbers through it as well as quotes from other people and so on. So hopefully at the end, the novice will have an overview of Ernest Shackleton, and hopefully the experts of who there are many, including the Honourable Alexandra, and I know other members of the family, Jonathan and John and so on, through the floor, but hopefully they'll pick up something new. Um, at the end, if I have time, I'm going to ask the questions. I'm not taking questions from the floor, okay? <laughs> um, okay, so, I mean, to start, to start with, um, Ernest Shackleton, obviously, this, this quote is um, Raymond Priestley, one of the founders of the Scott Polar Research Institute. He was a contemporary of Shackleton, Scott and Amundsen. He is first exposure to Antarctica was on Shackleton's Nimrod expedition. If you're a novice and you're saying, what's Nimrod? We'll come to it. Um, he would have been aware of Munston, obviously, and he was with Captain Scott on the Terra Nova expedition as well. But I think this is a really good summary of a lot of Ernest Shackleton, but I think there's a lot more to him as well. So, you know, Scott for scientific method, and Munston for speed and efficiency, but when disaster strikes and all hope is gone, get down on your knees and pray for Shackleton. <coughs> How did I come across Ernest Shackleton? Well, Ernest Shackleton found me. As a teenager, um, I bought a second-hand treasure island. I brought it home, and uh, a postcard fell out as a page marker. <coughs> and it was from Ernest Shackleton to Jacobs, the biscuit makers, to thank them for supplying biscuits to his Nimrod expedition. So, the Shackletons, the Jacobs, there's an Irish Quaker connection there as well. There was no stamp on the postcard. I know the Shacklemans always put stamps on their postcards, so I suspect this was given to a relation to give to one of the Jacobs, and it just never got there. It ended up as a page marker. Um, we're going to talk a lot about Antarctica, so we're going to do a crash course in some aspects of Antarctica. Um, we're going to talk a bit about latitude. Next year, if I'm asked back, I'll talk about longitude. But latitude <laughs> is important in the polar regions because when you get to the equator is zero degrees, the North Pole is 90 degrees north latitude, the South Pole is 90 degrees south. So the latitude is the horizontal lines across the globe. But when you get to 90 degrees south, there is no longitude. It's the only direction is north. So we we'll talk about, in general, the polar explorers, latitude is very important. Um, so we we'll talk a little bit about that. So the thing you need to know about latitude is, um, it's coming later with the numbers, uh, the, as I say, there's 90 degrees north, 90 degrees south. Each degree is broken into 60 minutes. Okay, so 60 minutes, each degree is 60 minutes, and each minute is one nautical mile. So if you get that in your head. Okay. The other piece here on the bottom left is the poles. There's more than, there's at least two po poles, uh, polar methods, polar measurements. There's the axes, the axle on which the Earth spins, and so that's the geographic North Pole or South Pole. But there's also where a compass points to, and compasses were very important. All these people were sailors and navigators, um, if they weren't scientists, but th there was huge interest in magnetism a hundred years ago, because it's, it's, it was the GPS, it's, it's what navigation was based on. So, um, so we have the North Magnetic Pole and the South Magnetic Pole. And to make it even more interesting, they move around a little, okay? So, so we have geographic poles, that's what the Earth spins on, and we have magnetic poles. And this diagram here shows sort of between 19, 19, oh, whatever, 1909, 1912, whatever, the movement of the magnetic pole. It's, it's on the Antarctic continent, but it drifts around a little. Just, um, it, you know, we turn the Earth on its, its end here, and we're looking at Antarctica. So, the areas that I'll be talking about are the Ross Sea area, where the British expeditions generally started from. One of the reasons for that being that um, New Zealand was 
the British colony and they could replenish and refuel there and then go into this sort of bite out of Antarctica, which is the Ross Sea. Um, the, diff the distance, the broad dis dif distance from the coast to the, to the geographic pole is 750 nautical miles, 800 and something ordinary miles. You can turn it into kilometers yourself. The, um, and the general sort of anatomy of a, a, a polar expedition 100 years ago was try and leave Europe around August, arrive to Antarctica, maybe via New Zealand uh, in January, um, set up your shore base and your supplies, so maybe build a hut or let the ship freeze in as, a, as, as its base, as the base for the year. Um, and the ship might, if the ship was leaving to go back to New Zealand or somewhere like that, it would try and get out by end of February. Um, otherwise it might stay and be frozen in, as happened Captain Scott and the Discovery. Um, you would trial some equipment, but remember the seasons are flipped over. So as you move on from March, you're getting into the polar winter and you will have darkness for 24 hours for some period of the year. Uh, plus, it's just extreme weather. Um, so you might try your equipment, do some short um, expeditions. Then you'll overwinter, keep everybody entertained, keep everybody sane. Um, then as soon as the spring starts to come in, so the, the, the southern hemisphere spring, which would be February, September, October, you might start your sledging expeditions. Um, and then a relief ship might come down again in January to collect you or to resupply you if you're going to stay for another year. Okay, so, so we're going to start at the end. We're going to start 100 years ago, Ernest Shackleton died the 5th of January, 1922. And let's talk about that, that expedition. We're going to call it a quest expedition after the ship um, he used. Sorry, I'm just going to go back to the slide for a second. The, the other sea I'll be talking about here in Antarctica is the Weddell Sea up here off South America, off the Falkland Islands, off South Georgia. You've got the Weddell Sea and let's say the Ross Sea. So if you can get sort of a, a picture of that in your mind. Um, so the quest expedition um, was, um, as I say, it left um, around 1921. Originally, the plan was, uh, and here it is from the, uh, um, a newspaper in Christiana. Originally, Ernest Shackleton, at the start of 1921, he was going to go north. He was going to go to the Beaufort Sea and explore around there. But he's not the first explorer to say he's going to go north and then go south. So the, he had an arrangement with the Canadian government to, to explore around there, but that arrangement fell through. So he decided to go south. And a school friend, uh, John Quiller Rowett, um, sponsored this expedition. And there's Ernest Shackleton and John Quiller Rowett, and Frank Wilde, Shackleton's loyal right hand man. We'll hear about him through the talk. Um, here they are looking out of the cabin of the Quest, which has been refurbished. And here's a letter uh, from a young lad to the King, and I'll read it out to you. To His Majesty the King, dear sir, will you please? Try and persuade Sir E. Shackleton, the explorer, to take me to the South Pole with him. My parents are agreeable. If I don't go, my life will be wrecked. Okay, please do your best. If you succeed, please send word quickly. I will live in the cold place, the cold bunker, uh, if I can only go. I am not joking when I say that. Okay, so, Eric Shackleton was a superhero, a rock star at the time, and everyone wanted to go on that expedition. The ship itself, the quest, uh, again, it was, it was, the ship itself, there were problems with it, just with the, the engine and the alignment of the engine and so on, so it kept giving problems. But it was quite an advanced, it was quite a scientific program on this, around magnetism, biology, geology, and so on. It had some very new equipment on it. It had a, a gyro compass, it had, you know, a, a sort of a, a depth, um, thing that could drop down and get samples from the very bottom, um, and it had labs for photographer, labs for um, scientists, and so on. So it was quite advanced, uh, and the um, the <coughs> and there's Ernest Shackleton up here. He, he took two scouts with him, ran a competition, a national competition. <coughs> they selected two scouts. Uh, Scout Mooney on the left was so seasick by the time they got to Lisbon, he had to go home. Um, Scout Mar proceeded on and became quite an eminent scientist in, 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 his, in his life. Um, I think um, down, down on the right hand side, so we're starting to do the silver line up in the top right, uh, 
We had heard here, we had heard that nine was Ernest Shackleton's favourite number, so nine will be popping up quite a bit. We have nine Norwegians here today, so that might be a lucky <laughs> moment. Um, but uh, uh, there was um, a book, a biography of Ernest Shackleton by the Fishers around 1957, and actually in the brochure for that, there was a small exhibition in London, but in the brochure of that, it, it says, Shackleton always regarded nine as a special number. He was married on the 9th of April, 1904. He reached his furthest south on the 9th of January 1909. Um, uh, and on the, the 9th of April, um, after many months marooned on the Weddell Sea Ice, Shackleton and his 27 men embarked on three ships' boats in a perilous journey to Elephant Island. But also, supposedly, a silver nine was on his cabin door. And that's the cabin which you've probably heard about. You've seen the documentary um, tomorrow evening uh, on the restoration of that cabin, which um, via uh, Eugene Furlong and, um, <clears throat> and a, a man in Norway who preserved the cabin, we have got the cabin here to come to the new museum. <laughs> but here again, another letter, and these letters just say so much about Ernest Shackleton. Exactly a month before he died, so he died on the 5th of January 1922, this letter is dated 5th of December 1921, it's in a bookcase downstairs, and again, a lot of the stuff I talk about, you'll be able to pick up more by talking to people or by looking at the exhibitions. Um, but he's in Rio, he spent about a month in Rio trying to fix problems with the ship. He's under pressure to try and get down south um, before it gets too late. So this is December and he still has work to do on the ship and he's in Rio. So a little girl came to visit the boat to see what it was about. And here's his letter back to her. Little girl with many names, thank you for your letter and the photo and for your wishes to us. I like the picture of Query our dog and my fat hand and trousers. We are thinking of stealing you to make a laughing happy mascot for the quest. This is not only my idea, but of all the officers who met you. There is much to do, so this letter earns, ends with love. From Ernest Shackleton, or the boss, or Shacks, or Icebergs, or Old Cautious, or whatever you like to call me, I answer to them all. So, I think it just says again so much, that here is someone under pressure, with a crew, trying to get going, and he takes time to write this lovely letter to this girl who he doesn't, he doesn't know her name. Um, but they, they left Rio de Janeiro, um, and Ernest Shackleton really only started, they left during December um, 1921. Ernest Shackleton started keeping his diary at the 1st of January 1922. Each entry had, had a piece around what happened, but it also had a little bit of poetry, because he was quite a poet. And he, although he drew on poetry to express some very deep feelings and some very important moments. Um, he also inspired poets, where, where we'll see later on. Um, so here's his entry for the 4th of January. He had gone ashore to the Norwegian whaling station at Gritviken on South Georgia. And this was key, a key place for um, the endurance expedition, which again we'll talk about. And he had met some people who knew him and whatever. And um, he came back on board the ship, on board the quest. He was feeling some pains in his chest. He asked Dr. Macklin for some medication. Dr. Macklin gave him medication, uh, went to bed, and later on called Dr. Macklin in the early hours of the 5th of January, 1922, um, and he had a heart attack and died. And again, downstairs, you'll see his death certificate in, in one of the cases written out by Dr. Macklin. Um, but his last entry in the diary, at last, after 16 days of turmoil and anxiety, on a peaceful, sunshiny day, we came to anchor in Gritviken. How familiar the coast seemed as we passed down. We saw it with full interest, the places we struggled over after the boat journey. Now we must speed all we can, but the prospect is not too bright, for labour is scarce. The old smell of dead whale permeates everything. It is a strange and curious place. And in this lovely line, a wonderful evening, in the darkening twilight, I saw a lone star hover, gem-like, above the bay. So that's his final entry. Okay, we'll pick that up later on in the talk, so Ernest Shackleton, um, as I say, a hundred years ago. Let's go back to the New World <coughs> Expedition, let's pick up on the 9th. So, 9th of January 1909 is a very important date. Um, Ernest Shackleton had set off on his own expedition, and again, I think it's fair to say he was tolerated by the Royal Societies, who really dictated what happened in a, in, in, in a lot of the exploration world. The Royal Society, the Royal Geographical Society, tolerated him. They mightn't have been his biggest fan all the time. So any expedition he organised was privately organised. So you just think about it. Here he is, um, what is he? He's, he's sort of 32, 33, and he's organising this expedition to try and get to the South Pole. He gets his crew together, um, 
and he buys an old ship, the, an old Newfoundland sealer, the Nimrod, um, raises money from various benefactors, um, and heads down to Antarctica via New Zealand. Um, he builds his hut at, at Cape Royals. There's a whole story about this which I won't go into, but for our, our brief overview, it's, it's enough. Um, again, innovation, the British expeditions tend to try new technology and new equipment. Uh, on this one, he brought ponies for haulage. Might sound silly, but Siberian ponies were sort of well hardened to the weather and whatever. It did turn out dogs were probably a better option. But he also brought a first motor car and a lot of new material, you know, the gabardine, windproof type layers, layering of clothing and so on. Nutrition as well, so scurvy was still a big issue. So um, he had got advice from Colonel Beveridge who was equipping, you know, he was a food scientist of his day. He was, he was equipping the British soldiers, the British army for, for their ration packs, so an absolute expert. Um, but it so happened by eating fresh meat as well, by eating seal meat and penguins when they got to Antarctica, it, uh, anti-scorbotic, it, it kept scurvy away. So actually on a, an expedition that Ernest Shackleton ran, there was very little or no evidence of scurvy on any of them. But he, he got down there, uh, overwintered, uh, September, October, set off, a few expeditions went, went off at, at that stage. Um, one, four of them set off for the South Pole with four ponies. As the ponies died, they would, or as the ponies were worn out, they would shoot the pony and depot it, and that was going to be a food supply um, forward and, and on the way back. Um, and, and so here's what happened. Um, you can see, with, with Captain Scott, we'll talk about that in a minute. It was Captain Scott in 1902, they had got to around this point, but Ernest Shackleton got to this point on the 9th of January, 1909, and there is the South Pole. Um, so he got to 88 degrees 23 minutes, and from your recently acquired knowledge of latitude, <laughs> you'll, you'll be able to work out that if you add 37 onto 23, you get to 89. So 37 onto 23 gives you 60, that's one degree. So now we're at 89, and then another 60 gets us to 90. So he was 97 miles from the South Pole, okay? And here we have a photograph taken with, um, I think this is Adams, Wild, Frank Wild, again, who we, who we saw in the first photograph, and uh, Dr. Marshall and Ernest Shackleton took the photograph of their furthest south with a flag that Queen Alexandra had given them um, to, to plant. Um, but over here, another, another group had set off um, to try and get to the magnetic south pole. Um, and they reached that a week later on the 16th of January, 1909. And again, some great names came out of that. That's Douglas Mawson, I think, in, in the middle. No, Douglas Mawson on the right. Uh, Professor David here on the left. And the doctor whose name escapes me, but some of the experts can tell me. Um, anyway, so, sorry, I was just forgetting uh, but, but they reached the, the, the magnetic south pole. And again, just Professor David, who was a geologist, a Welsh geologist who ended up in Australia, he was giving a talk on Ernest Shackleton um, when he came back, uh, and he was asked, where is Ernest Shackleton from? And um, so the answer was, uh, you know, he was born in Ireland, educated in England, worked in Scotland, but as far as my opinion goes, said Professor David, I should say that Lieutenant Shackleton is most essentially from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot an Irishman. He has all the best characteristics of the Irish race. So, your opinion may have changed, but that's what Professor David said. And we're trying to get a view of Ernest Shackleton from those who knew him. I think on the return journey, we mentioned Frank Wild, and again, another view. Here's another view of Ernest Shackleton. Here are two diary entries. The top one is Ernest Shackleton's entry for January the 31st. Started at 7 a.m. Wild bad with dysentery. Now that's not really bad with dysentery, that is Frank Wild is bad with dysentery. <laughs> picked, up, picked up a mound at 4 p.m. and camped at 6 p.m. Very bad surface, did 13 miles. And actually when you look at the diary entries, Ernest Shackleton's diary entries, they're generally longer. They start to get shorter as they're, they're short of food, they're rushing back to try and get back to their base. This exact same day, Frank Wilde says, and the underlines are there, and actually there's double underlines, unfortunately PowerPoint didn't let me do it, but there's double underlines uh, on the I do and by God. 
So, shackled and privately forced upon me is one breakfast biscuit, and would have given me another tonight had I allowed him. I do not suppose that anyone else in the world can thoroughly realise how much generosity and sympathy was shown by this. I do, and by God I shall never forget it. Thousands of pounds would not have bought that one biscuit. Okay, you get a view of Ernest Shackle from there, I think. Um, we're going to switch back now to his origin. So we have, we have his final expedition, we have covered it, we have covered the Nimrod, his furthest south. So now we're going to go back to 1874. Uh, uh, Henrietta and Henry Shackleton, uh, both the Shackleton family came to Ireland from Yorkshire around 1700. Uh, Quakers to a Quaker settlement a few miles away from here and actually they were educators. They founded a school which, which was across all denominations and I think there were female pupils as well. So, you know, in that school we had a United Irish man who was a revolutionary, um, we had Ireland's first cardinal and we had a British politician, Ed, Ed, um, Edmund Burke. So, you know, as I say, educators and very high standard. The family eventually, the family grew to um, ten children, eight girls and two boys and many of those had their own careers and would have, would have been famous as well, overshadowed a bit maybe by their, their uh, elder brother, uh, Ernest. And there is this bird note, it's from the Irish Times, it's downstairs um, and it's Shackleton on the 15th inst, the wife of Henry Shackleton, Kilkeen Kildare Esquire of a son. So, that's, that's the, the birth. Um, the family lived in Ireland for um, until about um, 1884. Henry Shackleton went back to train as a doctor. They moved to Dublin and then they moved to London area where Henry set up a practice. And by all accounts was, was just a very genial, helpful sort of doctor. Um, Eleanor Marks was one of his patients, uh, Carl Marks' daughter. Um, he, uh, there's, I mean, when you see a school photograph, you always say, who's the guy with his head sticking out the window up on top? And that's Ernest Shackleton. <laughs> uh, age 16, so around 1890, he, he had sort of been onto his parents, he wanted to go to sea. There was no great seafaring in the family, that I know of anyway. And um, I think his parents probably thought this was going to be a one-trip wonder. Again, you know, sailing in a merchant navy in those days was the tall ships away for nine months a year, all around the world, carrying, carrying trade. Um, so he got signed on as an apprentice, as a boy, to a ship called the Houghton Tower, sailing out of Liverpool. Um, and he went on that trip, his, he, he came back, he wanted more, he continued through his Merchant Navy qualifications, second mate, first mate, by 1898 he was a master mariner. On one of his trips back, he brought three alligators back for his sisters. <laughs> Fate, hope and charity, they ended up in London Zoo, as I understand it. Um, how to impress your sisters. Um, but one of his sisters introduced him to a friend of hers, Emily Dorman, who was, um, who lived close by in Sydney. And they fell in love, Ernest and Emily. Um, they shared a great love of Robert Browning, the poet. And in fact, one of um, Emily's first gifts to Ernest Shackleton was a, a book of Browning's poetry. Um, and again, we'll, we'll hear more about Emily and we'll hear more about Browning's poetry as we, as we go through. But after his first voyage, the captain of the ship said that Shackleton is the most pig-headed, obstinate boy I have ever come across. Dot, 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 dot. But I would take him on any voyage. <laughs> so as I say, he was... Um, Master Mariner, um, 1900, he was serving as third officer on a ship that was bringing troops to South Africa, Boer War. He decided to, um, to publish a book himself. He fairly well pre-sold it to all the soldiers on board, so his costs were covered. Um, and, and that's his first publication. A special bound volume was sent to Queen Victoria. And here, as you can see at the bottom, is his, the entry for the 1901 British Census. And you can see he's here. He's, he's obviously he's courting Emily at the time. He's visiting the Dormans, and here he is, Ernest Shackleton, a visitor, 28, Master Mariner, um, Ireland Kildare. He was getting a bit bored with the merchant sea life, as a merchant as a sailor, merchant navy, um, and also I think he may have wanted to impress Emily and really get some status, but I think he was the sort of character as well, when there was something really interesting going on, he wanted to be involved. Um, so, 
The British, as lots of other nations at the time, Antarctica very new continent. The first confirmed footstep on Antarctica was 1895, and we were talking about 1900, 1901. Um, Captain Scott uh, was, was chosen to lead a, sort of an exploratory expedition to Antarctica on a specially constructed research ship, the, the Discovery. If you're ever in passing through Dundee in Scotland, Discovery is there. It's a fantastic ex exhibit to, to visit. And Shackleton, through various contracts, through just his just being around Shackleton, he got himself as one of the few merchant seamen on that expedition. Most of the crew were Royal Navy or scientists from the scientists, you know, from the various universities or the Royal Societies. Um, here's the crew, and there is Captain Scott in the middle. There's Ernest Shackleton in, in Sydney, obviously. I just have another guy from Dunleary, from Dublin, Hartley Farrar. He, he was a geologist. And back up here, you have Frank Wilde and you have Tom Crean. So Crean joined the ship in New Zealand when Scott was looking for some extra crew. Um, and again, that ship went via New Zealand to Antarctica. The ship was frozen in and used as the winter base. They also had a small hut. Um, and that, the, the following polar spring, so the following sort of October, uh, three set off to see how far inland they'd get really. It was, it was trying new equipment. Again, when you go inland in Antarctica, you can't live off the land. Um, there's nothing in there. So really you bring everything with you once you go inland. And it was very, you know, very untried, untested equipment. Um, but again, three were going to go. And who ends up one of the three? We end up with Ernest Shackleton. And who ends up in the photograph with his flag in the background? Ernest Shackleton. Captain Scott and Dr. Wilson. So they headed off. Um, by December, Christmas 1902, they were all suffering from scurvy. Um, and at the end of that year, at the end of 1902, they turned back. They got to 82 degrees 17, and with your new knowledge of longitude, latitude, you'll be able to work all that out yourself. Um, they got back. On the way back, Ernest Shackleton seemed to suffer worst from scurvy and at times wasn't able to pull the sledge. And actually, on one stage, he overheard Do heard Dr. Wilson talking to Scott, saying he's not going to survive. Um, but they did get back to their ship. They all made a quick recovery when they started eating fresh food. The doctor certified Ernest Shackleton as recovered. Everything was fine. But a relief ship came down, and for whatever reason, Scott sent Ernest Shackleton home. And here he is. And you have to say, it is the poor boy something has been taken from him and he's been sent home okay the bad boy but he's not it's not a bad boy but it just you know it wasn't his plan to be sent home but again being in a shackle him, he arrived home it was like an astronaut coming back from outer space he was able to give talks he was in in much demand for other expeditions to fit out the next ship that was going to go down to collect scott scott decided to stay on for a year um but but that's him again he he turned it into his advantage and um became quite popular and in demand. He, he also he became secretary of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society at the time, and on the 9th of April 1904, he married Emily. Um, and they, they lived in Edinburgh, where he was a, a secretary of the Geographical Society. And Jo Wolfe, um, who, who is writer in residence there, she, she gave a talk last year, a really interesting talk on what Ernest Shackleton did there. He revolutionized it, really. But there's quite a nice article by Joe in the Nimrod Journal, if, if you get a chance to, to look at it. Um, Emily said about Ernest Shackleton, she said lots of things about him. One of the things she said was, one of his greatest qualities was that he never repined or railed at bad luck. I never heard him use the expression as connected with himself. He never made a moan about anything. And again, that same optimistic, positive, what's happened has happened, uh, looking forward. The, the family grew to, to three children, Raymond, Cecily, and Edward, and Edward was the Honourable Alexandra's father. Um, and so here's Ernest Shackleton, the, the family man. So we've sort of now clocked up to, we've we come on to the Nimrod expedition. We have covered the Nimrod expedition. You know, the Nimrod came after he had been with Scott. And he, as I say, decided to organise his own expedition to try and get to the South Pole and almost got there. Um, but when he came back from the Nimrod expedition, he was, he was just public property. He was a public hero. The, the, the newspaper here is, um, you know, welcome home from the far south, the hero of the moment. A, a ticker tape reception in, at Charing Cross Station and in London. 
So, you know, we're at 19, we're at, let's say we're at 1909 now. He was knighted, Sir Ernest Shackleton. Um, and here he, he came to Ireland um, and he gave a talk in what's now our National Concert Hall and he also gave another one at a, a local hospital. Um, and what was typical Ernest Shackleton after a talk, and the talks were a lot bigger than my talks, the talks would be crammed out, they were the big event of the time, and he would give the funds to the local charities. And this was, um, he had met Lady Dudley, Lord Dudley had been the Governor General in Ireland, they had moved to Australia, and on his way back from the Nimrod expedition, he met Lady Dudley, she said, can you give a talk when you get to Ireland for the health scheme, it was really the start of our health service in Ireland, um, that, that these people were involved in district nursing. Um, and, of course, true to his word, he did. He also got involved, and it's, it's a, I think it's just an interesting piece, the, there's, um, there was a movement at the time, it was a sort of social development movement, the idea was to bring university education to the masses, uh, and um, one, one organisation was an organisation called the Browning Settlement in Walworth in London. So, they, really, it was the areas of deprivation, um, and there would be a creche and a homework club and education classes, cookery classes, holidays for children in the summer. Um, and so, you know, it, it actually exists still to, to today, it still operates as a charity. But Ernest Shackleton became president of that in 1910 and was president until about 1920. And it's something that um, we had been following up the sort of archives there and we understood that they, they had been destroyed in World War II bombing. But just in the last six months, whole archive was for sale and we have contact with that so hopefully we'll do some interesting research on that but, but he definitely he was an active participant and there are photographs of him uh, at the Browning settlement. Himself and Emily by the way and you know again with Emily they were involved, Emily got involved with Girl Guides, Guides and Ernest Shackler with the Scouts. As I said the years ticked down, we had um, 1911, we had Raoul and Munston arriving at the South Pole, we'll hear a lot more about that from Guyer. Uh, later on today. Uh, six weeks later, Captain Scott and four others get there. And then in April 1912, Titanic sinks. Um, the Board of Trade inquiry into uh, the sinking of Titanic uh, took place over the summer of, of, 19, of 1912. And when they were looking for a, a sort of an expert witness in how to operate a ship in ice, they got her in a Shackleton. Um, and his, his evidence is, is just, you can see it online if you look up poor trade, trade inquiry into the Titanic. But it's just very strong and very from the point of view of someone who's worked on a ship and someone who's captained the ship. He also managed to raise a bit of a laugh from a council who was absolutely, the White Star Council was barricading about the ice in the north is different from the ice in the south and whatever else. Um, but uh, it's just really forthright evidence. Uh, you know, interesting little pieces, it's not binoculars, it's not the lack of binoculars. It, in fact, the uh, the human eye scanning a horizon will, will cover more distance and spot something different. You can then focus in on it with binoculars, but it's, it's not the lack of binoculars that caused Titanic to sink. Um, so these years were passing by, and Ernest Shackleton, he was starting various businesses involved in various other ventures and so on um, in, in, in Britain. Uh, plus in Hungary, he had an interest in Hungarian mining at one stage. Um, and. Uh, but when, when Amundsen discovered the South Pole, the, the Daily Chronicle, um, when news came back, the Daily Chronicle ran an article, but again, um, you can see it on their article by Sir Ernest Shackleton, he was sort of the contributor, the expert contributor to the Daily Chronicle. Um, around the same time, and the full circumstances I can't tell you, but um, this is uh, just a page from Kathleen Scott, um, Robert Falcon Scott's um, turned out to be his widow, at the time they didn't know what had happened Scott, the, the news about Amundsen came back a year ahead of the news about Captain Scott. But in it she says, Shackleton is behaving in a thoroughly Shackletonian way, I think he is delighted at the turn things have taken, I would willingly assist in that man's annihilation. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on, we'll move on. Um, but he was one of the heroes, he was one of the great explorers and here he is in, in the United States with Raoul Amundsen. Shackleton in the middle and Robert Peary who claimed to be the first to the North Pole on the right hand side. And, and I think the little piece here on the left is what a Munston supposedly recorded when he passed 88 degrees 23 south on his way to the South Pole. And again I don't want to take any of Geyer's thunder on this one, but just this little section. Sir Ernest Shackleton's name will always be written in the annals of Antarctic exploration in letters of fire. 
So this is the regard of one explorer to another. And you know, they had huge respect for each other um, um, you know, in, in throughout their lives. But again, as I say, all this is happening and Ernest Shackleton is sort of there, there is sort of a, a man without a mission at, at a particular time. And so he, he decides the one the one last great remaining thing to do is to cross Antarctica from coast to coast. So one ship is going to come in from the, the South American side, from the Falkland Islands, South Georgia end, into the Weddell Sea. It will drop uh, a small party. This time they have, they have dogs, 64 dogs. Uh, he had mechanical sledges as well, and an aero sledge, sort of a thing with a propeller that could, could haul sledges. Um, but they were going to go over by the South Pole. Another ship would have come in from Australia, New Zealand, into the Ross Sea. They would have laid the depots up towards the South Pole. So the party coming over would pick up those depots, and it couldn't be easier, could it? Um, I'm not going to talk anything about the, the, the fate of this particular expedition. We're going to talk about the Endurance expedition. The Endurance was the ship that came in here. And again, we're going to hear a lot more from someone much more qualified to talk about it uh, from Menson Bound later on. So I'll just cover it briefly. Um, endurance left at the outbreak of World War I, literally, found its way down to South Georgia, where it, it spent about a month re-equipping or replenishing and whatever else. Um, there is other reasons maybe as well. And then headed into um, the Weddell Sea. And really from the end of January on, it was frozen in the ice. It really didn't get to move itself from then on. The ice drifts in a circular movement, a clockwise movement around the Weddell Sea. Again, we'll hear a lot more about that. But the ship was caught in this, this vice, vice grip of ice. Drifted around sort of from as I say, they left South Georgia December 1914, January 1915, they're caught in the ice, it drifts around, slowly the ship is sort of crushed, ground, ground down, really by September, October, it's, it's sort of make, make or break, it's, it's, they might get out, but if things go wrong, the ship is going to get crushed and sunk, and that's what happened. Um, and yes, so he left, Buenos Aires, thinking he had 27 crew, three days later, on the, on the way to South Georgia, three days later a stowaway appears, Percy Blackborough. Um, <laughs> lovely photo of Percy Blackborough, he was the youngest on the ship. Um, and what Blackborough said about Ernest Shackleton, he was a tall, broad-shouldered man, possessed of a very generous nature with which he combined extraordinary powers of endurance and hardihood. He was optimistic even when things looked blackest. This inspired those who served under him. I think Percy Blackborough maybe only gave one talk in his life to a, to a local scout group or something, and he mentioned Ernest Shackleton. Um, but again, stowaways in those days could be just flown overboard. But he was signed on and looked after right throughout the expedition, she encouraged by Shackleton to read Encyclopaedia Britannica in, in the ship's library. When they got to um, Elephant Island after a horrendous boat journey, an open boat journey to get to Elephant Island, uh, in April 1916, uh, Blackborough was hugely suffering from frostbite. He actually had five toes amputated later on. But Shacklin carried him above the high water line on Elephant Island so he could be the first person ever to land on Elephant Island. So he gave what he could. <coughs> and this fantastic picture of endurance and Menson's picture and Menson's team's picture, which we'll, we'll hear later. I have a short clip of film of the last seconds of endurance. It's from the British Film Institute's DVD South, which you can get, and this is just a short clip. So just think about it. You're standing there, you've got 28 people with you, nobody knows where you are, nobody's gonna come looking for you, and this is unfolding in front of you.
Okay, I'm, I'm just going to move on for time reasons, but it doesn't get any better than that, okay? In the Shack News Bible, they were each allowed two pounds weight of possessions. He encouraged them to take photographs and letters from home because he was going to get them all home. He took, um, the, the Queen Alexandra had given two Bibles. Uh, uh, the one that was given to him, he tore out the flyleaf with her message to him. The, the 23rd Psalm, which is the Lord is my shepherd. And this piece from uh, the book of Job, which is, out of his womb um, came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven, and who had gendered it? The waters are, head, uh, the waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. So he knew his Bible, I mean, you know, was able to go there and take it out. I'm going to show you, uh, just again, the next is a short clip, to show you what they were enduring on the ice. They were moving camp, they were living on floating ice, and they were trying to move boats around and so on. They had to keep the lifeboats with them, they were in the Catch-22. The ice could break up at any stage, and they needed to be able to get into the boats. Um, so just a quick from a Channel 4 docudrama uh, with Kenneth Branagh as Ernest Shackleton um, of a particular incident that happened. Um, I let it run most of the way, but I might move on again for time reasons. So he didn't bring passengers. 
So the whole decision as to why he took them and why he didn't leave them with the, the 22 who were living in a, in a hut on Elephant Island is just fascinating. And lots of different opinions about it. Um, and then the bottom picture, when they arrived at the, at the whaling station, unfortunately they had shaved and cleaned by the time the photograph was taken. But uh, um, So they made it to the whaling station four attempts later, those attempts using a ship lent by the Norwegians, I think it was a British ship maybe, but it was lent by the Norwegians, a ship lent by the Uruguayan government, a ship sort of hired in South America, and finally the Elcho, the, the Chilean ship, um, that uh, was captained by uh, and, and crewed by the Chilean Navy, um, rescued the, the 22 from Elephant Island on the 30th of August, 1916. Um, yeah, I could, sorry, two slides out of order, I'm just going to go, go back on here. So that's the, what they, they turned the two boats under. 22 lived on Elephant Island under Frank Wilde's control, command. Each morning, Frank Wilde would say, roll up your gear, boys, and get ready. The boss might be back today. Um, and here is, can you imagine, you know, the ice cleared for just a few days around Elephant Island, and the Yelcho show appears. This is the fourth rescue attempt. The boat is lowered, it comes in, Ernest Shackleton and Frank Worsley were in the boat. According to Frank Worsley, as they were coming in, Shackleton was counting to 19, 20, 21, 22. Frank, they're all alive, I would have felt like a murderer if anyone had died. Mm. Everyone came back. So just uh, briefly, you know, um, uh, he inspired poets. Um, there was the whole thing, so uh, just a few sections I'm going to read to you here. Uh, the, the top left is as they approached the whaling station in South Georgia, having uh, Crean, Worsley and Shackleton having crossed the island, this is sort of the, the, the final link in the, in the chain of rescue, contact with the outside world. And, and Ernest Shackleton describes in South, in his book South, we flung down the ads from the top of the fall and also the log book and the cooker wrapped in one of our blouses. That was all, except our wet clothes that we brought out of the Antarctic which we had entered a year and a half before with a well-found ship, full equipment and eye hopes. That was all of tangible things, but in memories we were rich. We had pierced the veneer of outside things. We had suffered, starved and triumphed. Groveled down yet grasped at glory, grown bigger in the bigness of the whole. We had seen God in his splendours, heard the text that nature renders. We had reached the naked soul of man. How much more elemental can you get? It's, it's a quote, it's, it's taken from Robert Service's, um, one of Robert Service's poems, but he, he knew it, he was able to draw on it to express that pure, elemental place that they had got to on the endurance expedition. Um, again, his description of, um, of crossing South Georgia on the boat journey, and basically what he says is um, uh, that he felt there was an extra person with him, Afterwards, Worsley said to me, Boss, I had a curious feeling on the march there was another person with us. Cream confessed to the same idea. One feels the dirt of human words, the roughness of mortal speech, into trying to describe things intangible. But a record of our journeys would be incomplete without a reference to a subject very near to our hearts. Um, and here we have a whole piece around the fourth man, was there a fourth, the, the fourth person they felt that was inspiring them on. Uh, but in 1922, when T.S. Eliot was writing his poem, The Wasteland, he had come across Ernest Shackleton's account, and he puts these lines in The Wasteland. Who is the third who walks always beside you? When I count, there are only you and I together. But when I look ahead up the white road, there is always another one walking beside you, gliding, wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded. I do not know whether a man or a woman, but who is that on the other side of you? This extra presence. So again, as well as being a poet, he inspired poets. We've seen this already. A quick summary his expeditions, with discovery with Captain Scott, his own one where he almost got to the South Pole, endurance and quest. So finally, we're on to, uh, he died, he, lay, he was sort of, effectively, he, lay, he was brought to Uruguay to um, a military hospital where he sort of lay in state um, until just the day after his 48th birthday, actually the 16th of February. He was loaded on a ship, Lady Shackleton said he should be buried in South Georgia, he should be buried in Antarctica, that's where his heart should lie. Um, so he was brought back and buried in the Sealers Cemetery in South Georgia, in a grave that those digging it, they faced it north-south, not east-west as normal Christian burials, so as his heart would be that bit closer to Antarctica. 
And the inscription on his grave is very fitting. It's, I hold that a man should strive to the uttermost for life's set prize. I don't think I have time for questions. Uh, so uh, I'm going to stop. So thanks very much. Really.